and Alice, uh, Elise Cohen, excuse me, um, we have spent an enormous amount of time just through HOP talking about the new CFPB regs and the new Dodd-Frank regs, both through servicing uh, requirements that went into effect last January, um, but also now there's new origination requirements and a whole lot of rules that uh, we should be, as lawyers and housing counselors, at least be aware of and lawyers um, there's a lot of confusing things going on with the origination um, requirements. And so I'm very grateful for, to Elise to be willing to present to us today. It's going to be an hour and a half long webinar, um, but there's a lot of information. So hopefully um, it'll be useful and relevant and interesting. So Elise Cohen with uh, National Consumer Law Center, thank you. Thanks so much. It's wonderful to be with all of you. I know all of you spend a lot of time working on saving people's homes from foreclosure. I also work in that space, and so in doing that, we spend a lot of time thinking about loan modifications and kind of those types of strategies for how to save the home. What we're going to focus on today is what went wrong in the making of the loan and how can that be used generally when someone faces trouble to you know, improve their situation, what kinds of remedies are available, um, because I think although a lot of energy has been spent on modification, sometimes there's even a better solution available or sometimes modification is not an option. Um, a couple of things about the slides. The first one is um, I've been really, really busy with Congress and I just noticed now that although I reviewed the slides several times, I didn't put the proper date on it until so April 15th. And so I want to apologize. It's actually May 13th and I'm going to change my PowerPoint after we get off the training and I can send it to Empire Justice in case um, that's important to people. But I just wanted to flag that I do know what month and day it is. Um, I also wanted to flag that the slides that you have are very, very detailed, which I know violates one of the rules that they teach you at PowerPoint school. The reason we have the slides set up that way is because we're hoping that it's also kind of an introduction manual to you when you actually have a case. If the slides were very general, then you'd end up having to go straight to the National Consumer Law Center Truth and Lending Manual, for example, or another very, very dense source. And so the hope was to give you enough information to kind of get your bearings, know what the um, different boxes are that you need to kind of think through in order to get to where you're going. So I won't mention every little thing on every little slide, um, but you won't have to write things down because it's all there and then you'll have it afterwards. Just a moment about me. I worked at the Federal Trade Commission's Bureau of um, Consumer Protection in the Financial Practices Division for five years, um, and I worked on large-scale um, predatory mortgage lending cases. Um, this was kind of at the, the onset of public awareness of those issues in the mid to late 90s, and I've worked at the National Consumer Law Center for over a decade. A lot of what I do is policy work in Washington. I worked on the Dodd-Frank Act and getting the best possible provisions we could get in. We, you know, I and we at NCLC work with the CFPB regularly on the regulations. I also do a lot of trainings and lately I'm doing a lot of defense to try to preserve the Dodd-Frank rules. So I guess my one caveat for this entire training is, you know, a bill's been released even this week to change some of what's in these slides. We don't know what will happen with all of that, but when you have these types of cases, just remember to check back and make sure that things haven't changed because, unfortunately, they seem like they might be changing sometime soon, perhaps not for the better. That's funny. A moment ago, it worked to hit enter and make my slides go forward. There we go. So here's an overview of the topics that we're going to talk about today. I'm going to try to emphasize in many of the slides sort of what the different categories and boxes are because really doing an origination case is a lot about issue spotting and making sure you've kind of figured out which box your loans go into and which questions you need to ask. Well, we're going to talk a lot about the new Dodd-Frank protections. They only started taking effect quite recently, so there are also some provisions that are, you know, not decades old, but 
pre-Dodd-Frank that are worth considering, especially if you're getting people walking in who have loans that are you know, more than a year old. So we're going to talk about ability to repay claims, which are both pre and post Dodd-Frank, and the qualified mortgage, which is an aspect of the Dodd-Frank ability to repay rule. We're also going to talk about yield spread premiums, these broker kickbacks, and sort of what the rules are about how people who make loans can be compensated and what the rules are for how they can structure the loans. And that's also a pre and post Dodd-Frank rule. There are two price categories of loans that have special rules associated with them, taking the second of the two first. The high cost loans are the Home Ownership and Equity Protection Act loans. Those are loans that reach a certain threshold. The threshold has changed over time. Those are the most expensive loans and they have the most protections associated with them. It's a whole activity just to figure out if your loan is a high cost loan, it's a worthwhile activity for your client, if it's remotely a possibility because the protections and remedies are quite, quite substantial, which we will talk about. There are also more protections for loans that are so-called higher priced mortgage loans. So you have high cost and higher priced. Um, the difference is that the higher priced mortgage loans have some protections, not as many as high cost, but often more protections than a regular loan that's neither of those. And then lastly, there are some, in the last few years, disclosure rules. In the, you know, in the old days, not even that old, like a few years ago, we would often do a whole training on origination claims that really just focused on disclosure. What was the finance charge? How do you calculate it? All of that is still very important and a whole separate training but we're going to focus a lot today on what the substantive rules are and talk a little bit about what the timing is for the disclosure. So this is another slide that's sort of looking at what claims you have available to you and what applies. It's similar to the overview that we just did. Just to go through this quickly so you can have in your mind what the boxes are. So you've got the Truth in Lending Act and the high cost and the higher priced <coughs> rules are both part of the Truth in Lending Act. In addition, the steering rules for loan originator compensation and the disclosure rules and the ability to repay rules are all part of truth in lending. There are some protections under RESPA, both disclosure related and related to steering. And then there are a couple of outlier rules that are not part of either, but that also may apply in a mortgage case, particularly with regard to a prison. So now I'm going to do something a little unconventional. And I'm going to exit, oh, I guess that didn't work. Let me try again. I'm going to exit from the actual PowerPoint so I can show you this. I have one of those cool touchscreen laptops, um, which can do fun things, and this is one of them. This is a chart that you will have, you know, in your PDF of the PowerPoint. You won't be able to see all of it, but my understanding is that Empire Justice is going to make the chart itself available to you guys separately. Nina Simon developed, um, deserves most of the credit for making this chart. She was a former um, attorney at AARP and the Center for Responsible Lending and now is in private practice. He and I did um, a session at the conference together, several, on some of these questions that we're talking about today and she made this chart. And so this is really an issue spotting chart. You see on the left hand side it has some of these categories, HOPA, higher price mortgage loans, HPML, appraisal, disclosure, other things. And then, um, and then the very bottom one is Dodd-Frank qualified mortgage ability to repay. And it tells you sort of where the regs are and then it tells you when they apply. So if you have a client who walks in who had a loan that was made on January 1st, 2010, then you can go through and say, Ah, so the yellow box and the red box and the blue box apply, but the escrow rule for higher price mortgages didn't apply until later in 2010. And then going down further, you can see the advanced disclosures did apply then and the appraisal independence rules to some extent applied. <coughs> and there were some new disclosure rules from 2010 that also applied starting in January. But if the loan was made on January 1st, 2010, for example, the new ability to repay rules wouldn't apply. In fact, they wouldn't apply even if it were January 1st, 2014, because they didn't apply until January 10th, 
So this chart is something you should just you know keep by your bedside and refer to as often as possible when you're trying to do some issue spotting. Oh, I should have said from my current slide, but now I'm at the wrong slide. So let me go back and go like this. Great. So this is another chart about remedies because when you're trying to identify claims for your client, you're obviously not only thinking about what are the claims, you want to figure out how to get your client out of the challenging situation they're in and what remedies you can have available, especially if you're trying to weigh it against just getting a modification. You need to sort of know what you have available to you. And so this chart has three categories on the left-hand side. It includes you know, regular old truth and lending violations, high-cost high mortgage violations, and then the higher-priced mortgage rules. Um, these are really about the, like the first top TILA ones. They're more about the disclosure and the ability to repay is kind of a separate conversation. And we've got a bunch of that later um, in the slideshow. Then going across the top, I just want to skip ahead to the middle column, enhanced statutory damages. That is financially very similar to the last column of rescission, but rescission has a legal advantage which is there's no longer a lien by the creditor on the property. And so if you can get to that promised land, they can't foreclose on your client if you've exercised the right to rescind. That could be a whole session as well. How does that work? Um, enhanced damages, you get back, the client gets back, all the money that they've paid, um, including you know fees and interest, etc. cetera, um, but they don't have this pause on the foreclosure in the same way. So that also puts you in a different situation in terms of how you would proceed and what you need to do to protect your client's rights. Another thing this chart does is it identifies against whom you have the claim. You have it just against the creditor. You also have it against the assignee. So those are some advantages to this particular chart, which I think Nina also did. Great, so now we're going to pause for a moment and I'm going to launch the poll. The poll's question is, have you represented any homeowners in mortgage cases that included truth in lending claims, such as disclosure, high cost, HOPA, or higher, higher price mortgage loans? My goal here is to just figure out, you know, do people have experience with truth in lending? You know, where are we so that we can um, know who we all are on the phone and get a better sense of how to gear the conversation? So I'm hitting launch now, and it should be able to process relatively quickly. I'm watching the numbers change because the percentages change every time a new person votes. Um, so the numbers are changing a lot. Um, and there's clearly going to be a range of what people have experience with. And so for those at either extreme of the range, I would ask you to be um, patient and take from this what you would find most helpful. We've got about 75% of the people voting already. So if the last few of you can vote, that would be great. Then we'll be able to close it down. If you're totally new to truth in lending, which most people are, I'll mention again that NCLC has the truth in lending manual. My favorite part of the truth in lending manual is the table of contents. We now have electronic manuals which I don't know if Empire Justice has set up yet um, or whether your legal services or other law offices have done that. But it's very helpful because it has this table of contents on the left and you can kind of do an issue spotting exercise while you're um, trying to figure out the answer. So there is a table of contents, but I personally find it's really easy to kind of figure out what you need when you don't know by, by looking at that. And so when you're thinking through truth and lending, you'll think through both the disclosure issues that we're talking about today, but also a lot of these substantive protections, which are quite new and which are quite strong, which is why I'm spending a lot of time trying to stop them from being rolled back. And the banks don't want them to continue. So um, I don't know. At least I would just add that. Yeah. Sorry, this is Becky. So I would just simply add that they are, um, those books are quite literally, you can, I don't feel that you can truly litigate these cases without having access to 
and frankly using <laughs> highlighters and you know clips and all kinds of uh, well loved utilities uh, to to work with those books, but they are a critical component to successfully litigating these kinds of cases. They're really the rules are complicated and the books lay it out. And you're right, the index is invaluable. Well, so far my report shows me that. 82% of the people haven't done truth in lending cases, and so that may be new information for people. Um, I'll say that when I worked at the FTC and I was working on a big case against a lender for various forms of predatory lending, and we had some obscure types of claims we were developing, like on loan splitting and other things, I used the manual to figure out what the basis for the claim was. So um, thank you. This was very, very helpful. We're going to have some other polls later on. Um, Becky and Michelle, I don't know what I need to do to... Do I just hit close? Yep. Hit close, and you can move to the next thing. You are all here for my first webinar poll. Okay, so let's go on. I'm trying to. Okay, here we go. So let's talk a little bit about the Truth in Lending Act, and you know, it's big picture, and all of this very basic stuff is included in one of the early chapters of the Truth in Lending Manual in excruciating detail. And the reason for that is you have to first demonstrate that the loan applies to your client, that the law applies to your client's loan. And so there are some key definitions that you need to check out, and there are you know, often many decisions in any given year, you know, judicial decisions. Was the loan actually made by someone that's called a creditor? Was it made to someone who's actually a consumer? And was the loan primarily for personal, family, or household purposes? If the person has a small business in their home or they're a farmer or something else, they may have taken out the loan for kind of a mixed business and personal purpose, and there's a lot of discussion about that in the book. Um, and it's, so it's just important to make sure you line up your, um, you know, your checklist before you move on. There's a little asterisk here. I just want to point out that for those of you who already had a relationship with the regulations, the regulations under Truth in Lending are called Regulation Z. You can see that in the middle here. The numbers used to start at 226.1, et cetera, and now they're 1026.1, et cetera. And so I just wanted to flag that for people who are still thinking 226. So what's inside the Truth in Lending Act? A lot. So first of all, you've got several types of disclosure. That includes um, early closing, early and closing disclosures. Um, these are different from the old truth and lending disclosures, and we're going to talk about that later on. You've got disclosures related to if someone has a high cost or a HOPA mortgage, and there is a new combined T, you know, TILA, Truth and Lending Act, disclosure that comes along with the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act disclosures. That's all the mortgage closing papers, the HUD-1 and the TILA disclosure. They're all being combined. That takes effect in August, um, unless they announce that it doesn't. But as of today, um, on, although they're under a lot of pressure, it appears that it's going to take effect in August. And so after then, comes with these new disclosures. Um, we'll talk about it a little more, but let me just say, if you want to get more information about the disclosures prior to or you know, when your client comes in and you want to understand them better, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has excellent materials intended primarily for industry to train them on the disclosures. And so if you go on the CFPB website or you just Google CFPB Integrated Mortgage Disclosures, they have sample ones, they have little booklets. You can learn as much as you'd like about it. But what's interesting about Truth in Lending is it started out as a disclosure statute, but now it has a lot of substantive rights in it. So that includes the high cost, the higher price, the ability to repay, rules on escrow and appraisal. And it has some very, very powerful remedies. So let's talk a moment just about the basics of disclosure. Like I said before, we used to do whole, you know, trainings on just the. Don't forget to do this analysis when you have a case because you always want to look and see because if you can use the rescission remedy for a disclosure violation, it voids the lien on the home and there's no foreclosure. So it's a pretty big deal. So disclosures need to be clear and conspicuous. They need to be accurate, timely, and properly delivered. And there are certain disclosures that are considered material. Um, and so if those aren't done right, and there are tolerances for how that works, if those aren't done right, you can get a substantial 
remedy. There's also a, a document that people are supposed to receive called the Notice of Right to Cancel, and that tells them they're allowed to cancel for three days. After they get the loan, you know, no cost to them. If you don't get that, and frankly, if you don't get two copies of that, then um, there's a significant truth in lending violation there with the remedy. So here you can see rescission for a material disclosure violation of the notice of right to cancel. So that's very, very powerful. HOPA also has pretty unbelievable remedies. Um, so first of all, how does HOPA work and then what can you do with it? So HOPA um, applies now to more loans than it did prior to January 10th, 2014. So the first question, you know, when you're looking at a loan is when was it made? And then, you know, the closing date. And then after that, you'll be able to figure out sort of what applies. So now high cost mortgage rules also apply to purchase money loans and to um, home equity lines of credit to open end loans. But prior to this transition date of January 10th, 2014, which is the Dodd-Frank deadline, it was only for non-purchase money loans. It was only for refis, essentially. Also, the definition for creditor is different from what it is for other loans. High-cost mortgage loans are often not made by conventional lenders. They're made by what we might call hard money lenders. In Washington State, there's a dental practice that makes a lot of loans to people who owe a lot of money. Um, they may be considered a creditor under HOPA if they've made at least two high-cost loans in one year, or they made one through a broker. So if you're dealing with sort of more of a small fly-by-night-ish or informal operation, they may still be a creditor for HOPA purposes even if the TILA disclosure rules don't apply. And because your client will have gotten a high-cost loan, if you're asking this question, it's worth trying to figure that out. So there are um, two different sets of rules for whether the loan is covered by the high cost mortgage rules of the Home Ownership and Equity Protection Act, HOPA. There's a trigger based on the APR of the loan, and there's a trigger based on the points and fees of the loan. After the Dodd-Frank deadline, there's also a third trigger for prepayment penalty. There's a lot of text on this screen. We could spend an hour just on this screen. I just wanted you to have all the numbers in one place. It's also discussed in Chapter 9 in great detail um, of the Truth in Lending Manual. A lot of lenders who make expensive loans try to skate right under the HOPA triggers. That was true right when HOPA was first passed. Now I think it's more true of these informal lending arrangements. And so if it seems like it's skating on the border, it may be that they omitted a certain fee from the trigger, etc. And if you find that it goes in, then it's a HOPA trigger um, and it's a HOPA loan. And because they didn't think HOPA applied, there will probably be a boatload of violations and you'll have a lot of remedies for your client to help put them in a better situation. So this just walks through <coughs> what you can get rescission for under HOPA, which is mostly certain so-called prohibited terms. If I go like this with my arrow, you can see that, right? Yes. Um, and Elise, actually, before you dive into what what you can get through rescission, maybe you can give a, 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 an, ex, an explanation as to what rescission actually is. Sure. Well, I was saying before, so if I make a promise to you to take you out for pizza tonight, and then I rescind my promise, I'm no longer taking you out for pizza tonight. Um, so rescission essentially takes back the loan, um, and it's the homeowner taking back the loan agreement. And as I noted before, it voids the lien on the loan. And so by acting to rescind the loan, there's an automatic voiding of the loan. There's a lot of complex law around rescission. There's a whole chapter on it in the Truth in Lending book. But it essentially means that your client gets back everything they've paid and there's no longer a home. There is still a debt, and that debt is still owed. And so in order to do rescission, your client needs to be able to figure out what to do about that debt. In some places, they have to show in advance that you have to tender the money, that you can get a loan from somewhere else. That's more true um, in certain other jurisdictions. I don't think it's as true in New York, but I'm not an expert on a number of the New York bar. Um, 
So you want to make sure if you're doing that that you've kind of dotted your I's and crossed your T's. It is powerful, but it's not always the easiest remedy to get. But if you can get it, um, then you're in good shape because they can't take your client's house. Is that helpful? I think so, yeah. Somebody asked very speci a very specific question. I'm trying to broaden it for everybody. Great. Um, and so there's a way to rescind. That's like a whole other training. Like you have to send a letter saying we're rescinding and you also want to file a lawsuit when you're doing that and there are questions about whether the letter itself is enough. The answer is generally yes. You can, but you, there are statutes of limitations. You need to make sure that you at least send the letter during that time. It's better to file a lawsuit during that time, but the Supreme Court's been pretty clear that the letter is enough. Um, we don't win at the Supreme Court very often lately, so that was kind of a big deal. So that's rescission, and that's a fun topic for another day. But I just wanted to flag, you can get rescission for certain high-cost mortgage violations for prohibited terms. But there are many more prohibited practices under HOPA. It would also be great if we could spend the whole day just walking through what are all those prohibited practices, what do they look like, how do we find them. I was hoping in this training to more do an overview so that you guys have like a sense of issue spotting. For, for years now we've been spending so much time on loan modifications and foreclosure defense, rightly so, that we just wanted to make sure everyone had a sense of what's out there. And then as people start getting more of these cases, we'll be able to dig down more um, again, into how these things work. So prohibited practices include, you know, structuring it a certain way to get around HOPA or certain kinds of notice requirements. The last bullet there, you can see there's a much longer list, post dot frank for what the prohibited practices are. And it includes things like you can't finance points and fees because then you're adding more interest onto the loan and it's already an expensive loan. You have to certify that housing counseling has occurred and if you don't, that's also a prohibited practice. You cannot get rescission, so you don't void the lien on the house, but you get enhanced damages, meaning your client basically gets back all the money that they paid. So it's a big deal. I want to pause here for questions and see whether there are questions that would be helpful to answer, and then we can move on. Uh, yes, so there's, let's see, one more here. Um, since these protections hinge on when the loans originate, do loan modifications change that analysis? The answer is no. Um, that's a very good question. So the thing about a loan modification is it's not the making of a new loan. It's the changing of the terms of an existing loan. And somewhere in here there's a slide about a specific provision where we make clear that modifications aren't, aren't new loans for purposes of that rule. But in general, it's not a new loan. And so um, modifications are kind of apples and oranges with what we're talking about today. Are there other questions? Nope, that's it for now, thank you. Great, okay, so let's go on. Um, we were just talking about high cost mortgage rolls. So, you know, one thing I didn't do that I meant to do was to talk about the numbers, but maybe I just decided that was too detailed. So just to remember, let me put it this way. The higher price mortgage loans that we're now discussing in this slide basically map onto you know, subprime loans, meaning they're not the loans that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac generally would back. They're more expensive than that. They're purportedly for people with, you know, better than um, stellar credit, but they're often given to people whose credit's just fine, but they were unlucky enough to be steered into this more expensive loan. That is very common in um, poor communities and communities of color in particular, and there's been like a historic set of research on this showing that, that was an issue. So these are subprime loans. The high cost loans are even more expensive than that um, and have those specific triggers. It could have a prepayment penalty and not be expensive, but other than that, it would be the APR or the points and fees, and there's a whole definition of points and fees and a whole calculation on how to do that. But remember that the higher price mortgage loan rules also apply to high cost loans. Um, it's just that they pretty much overlap, and so you'll want to just double check. There are a couple of specific things like escrowing that applies here and not um, and not on high cost loans that would also apply for loan with high cost. So that probably requires a Venn diagram that I don't yet know how to make online. So um, you can see here 
that there are also issues about when the loan was made to figure out which rules apply. So the high price mortgage loans um, were affected by rules issued by the Federal Reserve Board. The effective date was October 1st, 2009. And then the second date, January 9th, 2014, that's the date before the Dodd-Frank rules take effect. And so then higher price mortgage rules are sort of more affected by all the other Dodd-Frank rules. And so you want to make sure you know which rules apply because there is um, there is a strong set of protections here for this particular window. Okay, I'm going to skip the slide and go back to it in a second and go to this one so you can understand how the scheme works. So a higher price mortgage loan, unlike HOPA, is not based on points and fees. It's only based on the interest rate or the APOR of the loan, the average, you know, the APR and how it fits with the average prime offer rate. So that's that's like a technical term that the Federal Reserve used to publish and now the CFPB publishes. If your APOR, if your APR is greater than your APOR by a certain amount, then, um, then and there are different rules for first lien and subordinate liens, then you're covered by these new rules. So you want to do the analysis, you want to figure out if you're covered, you want to make sure you do the details. The original, the earlier slide has those details on it. I'll go to it in a second. There's an ability to repay requirement for these loans that predates Dodd-Frank. That's one reason why it's really important. Another reason is they have very strong remedies, enhanced damages and rescission with this other provision related to prepayment penalty. So going back for a second, this is a slide that will tell you how to do the analysis to find out what A4 was. So you can then do the math to figure out if you've got a higher price mortgage loan. You essentially have to find the um, comparable information on this rate spread calculator. There is a lot of information in the book about it. If you find you're doing a case and you can't figure it out, call me or us, and we'll help you do it. There are some people in my office who enjoy doing that and would think it was fun to help you, in fact. Okay. So now we're going to just go ahead more about what you can get if you have a higher price mortgage loan. There is an escrow requirement if it's a first mortgage, a first lien mortgage. There are different effective dates if you've got a manufactured home loan versus a regular um, <clears throat> stick and mortar loan. And so notice that um, it requires the creditor to establish an escrow for taxes and insurance. And that can be canceled. Here you can see pre Dodd Frank. It can be canceled after one year. But post Dodd Frank, it has to be canceled only after five years, canceled by the homeowner. Why do we have this rule? We have this rule because a lot of people got subprime loans that didn't include taxes and insurance, but they didn't know it didn't include that, and they were shopping on the basis of what their monthly payment would be, and then they were stuck with these enormous, enormous bills for taxes and insurance that they often couldn't pay. And so by setting up the the escrow, the main is if the escrow is an administered right, but at least the monthly payment that people are getting for these more expensive loans incorporates all of that. So I just wanted to flag that for you. There's a lot of detail in here. If you have one of these loans, just kind of process through all of it, um, and that'll be helpful for you. Notice also in the Dodd-Frank section here, there's an exemption for small creditors, for rural creditors, and for creditors making loans in underserved areas. A lot of the Dodd-Frank rules have carve-outs for these various categories, and so know the creditor you're dealing with and how they fit into these special rules, and these rules are quite dynamic and changing all the time. There are a bunch of very, very helpful manuals on the CFPB website walking through what the rules are. Again, they're meant for creditors, but they're very helpful to people like us as well. So in addition to escrow, there's an appraisal rule for higher price mortgage loans. And again, the manufactured home rule has a later effective date um, and it hasn't even taken effect yet. So the goal here is to improve the quality of appraisals. A lot of people have been talking about how you know homeowners are underwater because property values tank. But many of us know that another reason that people are underwater is because they had inflated appraisals to begin with. And so this was meant to deal with pieces of that. So as you can see here, you have to have a licensed certified appraiser. 
and there has to be an actual written report based on an actual physical inspection of the interior. And then the homeowner needs to know why the appraisal is being done, and they have to get a free copy, and here you can see that there are exemptions. Um, and then here there are even more exemptions. So if it's violated, though, you can get um, some damages here, especially if your client is behind, the damages will decrease the amount of money they owe. Um, and so that's obviously advantageous to your client. So in addition to the higher price mortgage loan appraisal rules, there are separate appraisal rules that are about appraisal independence. All I really want to say is, if you think you've got appraisal rules or you have a higher price mortgage loan, take a close look at these. They're slightly different. They require slightly different things. They have slightly different coverage. Um, it's a bit of sausage making, but it gives you more leverage if you find irregularities. One way to deal with appraisal issues is to find someone to do a retrospective appraisal. So we've had um, attorneys with cases in-house at NCLC who worked as expert witnesses or otherwise who got a local appraiser to do a retrospective appraisal and say, oh no, at the time, that house was only worth X. And therefore, this is clearly inflated. And so that might help you with some of your appraisal independence issues. So what is LOCOM or LO compensation? That stands for loan originator compensation. Um, until relatively recently, we used to call that broker compensation. The reason the term changed, and it is somewhat unwieldy, is because it doesn't only apply to brokers now, it also applies to loan officers. And so whether you work for the, you know, the lender itself or you work for a broker or you are a broker, if you are getting paid to steer people, you're violating the rules. And there are different rules that apply based on when the loan was made. So you can see here at the top, the Federal Reserve Board issued a rule um, on loan originator compensation in January, in sorry, April of 2011. Dodd Frank was passed in um, July of 2010, and the Fed announced their um, compensation rule shortly before, and it took effect in in April. There was a lot of pressure on them to do that. It's a very very strict rule, um, and it. Um, applies <clears throat> based on when the application was received. If you have a case that's before 2011, which you may well have, there are anti-kickback rules in the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act, but that's all you've got. You don't have this particular loan originator compensation rule. The loan originator compensation rule, for some reason, also folded in a bunch of other protections. There are limitations on um, mandatory arbitration clauses, um, limitations on waiving federal claims, and there are other things too um, in some of the other rules. So if you if you end up with an origination case, there are limitations on credit insurance, for example. I couldn't fit it all in an hour and a half. You're going to want to go through the Truth in Lending Act and the regulation and the staff interpretation yourself, um, and you're also going to want to read all the relevant parts of Chapter 9 of the Truth in Lending Manual. So here you can see at the bottom that January 1st, 2014, um, there were new rules. I don't know why it says January 1st and then January 10th. I think that the rule took effect January 10th and not January 1st. I apologize for that. Um, the Dodd-Frank loan originator compensation rules are not as good as the previous Federal Reserve Rules. There are a bunch of loopholes, but they are there, and they do apply, and they're quite complex, and they're worth taking on and um, find that there was some um, likelihood that there was, <clears throat> that there was um, steering. And that will require probably a bunch of discovery and other things. We could also do an entire training just on the loan originator compensation rules. I have lots and lots and lots of slides on them. But essentially, people can't get paid to change the terms of the loan. And the homeowner make a payment 
to both the lender you know, and the broker. They're paying one or the other. Because I think when they don't do that, it changes the, you know, it changes the incentives because the broker is getting paid by the lender. Anyway. So that's the loan originator compensation rule. At the bottom, you can see there's also a reference to the credit insurance rule, for example. OK. The loan originator compensation rule does not have remedies that are as good as, for example, the ability to repay rule. But it's still here, and it's important to note. You can get different remedies against the creditor than what you can get against the loan originator itself, whether it be you know, a broker. The loan originator is um, the company that's the broker. Um, or it's the person that's the loan officer and you know, the company is liable for those violations. So you've got regular remedies against the creditor and the assignee, but when you go down and you get these enhanced damages, but when you're talking about the claim directly against the loan originator, which is in general you know, a smaller, less well capitalized entity, um, there is a damages cap. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so there are disclosure rules that we've talked about. Um, I took these slides from a longer presentation, so some things there are abbreviations that I didn't write out, and I apologize. So this one says Mortgage Disclosure Improvement Act. So that, for the first time, required that homeowners receive information prior to closing. That's pretty much correct. So before, people would get to closing and find out that the terms had changed from you know, the estimates they got initially, if they ever got any estimates at all. And that was how the law worked. As of July 30th, 2009, you're no longer in that situation if you've got a closed-end dwelling secured loan. Dwelling secured is pretty broad, um, so it includes manufactured housing, which is good. And so first you have to get the early disclosures within three business days of application. And then the final disclosures at least seven business days before closing. If those closing disclosures don't remain accurate, and there are standards for that, they have to provide corrected re-disclosures at least three business days before closing. Um, there are specific rules about what counts as inaccurate. Um, it's not that hard usually for them to get that done, but they're very concerned about it in the context of the new disclosures that are coming out, um, which are the big um, combined TILA and RESPA disclosures. And so it'll be interesting to see whether this becomes a huge problem because this law still applies to the truth and learning aspects of the, of the disclosures. So. Um, this is about that the new disclosure is here. The Dodd-Frank Act required um, the CFPB to combine the TILA and the RESPA disclosures. They did a lot of testing. And so now there's something called the loan estimate, and then there's something called the closing disclosure. It's sort of a similar scheme to this. Um, but now you have to provide all of your closing information, like all of the fees accurately three business days before closing. Um, so that's similar you know, to this. That's the last kind of timeline you get to do that. In industry saying it's very hard to do that. There is a 10% cushion for third party fees, meaning the cost of all the third party fees can go up up to 10%, and they don't have to redisclose, which is very, very generous. So what are the disclosures supposed to look like? That's also like a whole day we could just be training on that. Um, so there is this classic federal box. It's you know four boxes across with key information like the amount of finance and the finance charge, and then there's a schedule below that says how many monthly payments you may get one at what amount. Um, they changed you know the format once in 2011, and then there's this totally new format in um, <clears throat> August 1st, 2015 that they're going to have. These are the integrated disclosures. As I suggested before, if you're going to have cases where you're dealing with these forms, it's worth going on the CFPB website. It's very, very different from anything from before. It's very long and dense. The APR is buried on the last page. 
Um, there is a bunch of useful information like maximum payment and other things, but they're, they're quite dense. Remember that in addition to having a truth in lending remedy for any violations of these rules, you may also have violations of all the RESPA requirements for all the closing fees. But RESPA doesn't have a private right of action for disclosure of those fees. But you can bring a UDAP claim under your state UDAP law, or maybe you have other theories you can bring in New York to challenge those misleading disclosures. So this is yet another reminder that in addition to federal statutory law, and we're not even discussing all of them, there's obviously you know, Fair Debt and Fair Credit Reporting Act and other things you'll want to consider looking at your client's whole situation. You also want to ask yourself whether you have a state UDAP claim, whether there's some other state law that would be helpful to you. I know you guys also have very good regulations from the state banking department which might have changed its name to the state insurance department or something, I can't remember. Um, so use as much as you can and remember about um, extending the statute of limitations also even if you have a claim. So we're going to do a poll now and I didn't fill my water glass up enough so after I launch the poll I'm going to go do that and I apologize. The next poll um, is to get a sense of whether people are seeing the ability to repay issue. That was really a a major feature of the um, foreclosure crisis was that people got loans that from the get-go they couldn't afford. And so because Dodd-Frank was passed five years ago, even though the current provisions only took effect a year ago, it would be helpful to know what people have been seeing and whether they're seeing claims or they're seeing cases where, I'm going to launch it now, whether you're seeing cases that where the loans were made in the last five years and the loan was unaffordable when first made. So it's a yes or no question, but it's a common problem and um, you know we only have very new explicit claims for it. I'm going to go get water. I'll be back in a minute and we'll talk about the results. While Elise is gone, I guess I'll fill the empty airspace. This is Becky again. Um, you know, quite frequently um, when we're talking at a national level, state UDAP claims are thrown out as a possible tool for folks to use in these claims. Um, unfortunately, many of you are aware our state UDAP uh, provision is not the strongest out there. Uh, and it provides very limited relief. It does allow for attorney's fees for those of you who are able to collect attorney's fees, but your remedies are quite limited. Um, so most of the time I think folks who use UDEP tend to use it only as a way to recoup some attorney's fees. But there are other mechanisms and New York does have some pretty strong um, allowances or strong uh, regulations and the, the, some rules that allow you to kind of think outside of the box a bit. So I'm back, thank you. Um, you know, I had also ideally wanted to have a bunch of stats about New York and London, but you guys know the situation on the ground in New York better than I do, and so I thought I would stick to what I could give you that you didn't already have. Um, I'm sorry, your UDAP law is not as strong as it could be. Why don't you talk to Kirsten and see if she can fix that? Um, okay, so I think we're done voting. I'm going to hit close. I don't know if anyone can see the results but me, but we're 50-50. So 50% 50 of the people have had clients come in with a loan made in the last five years that were unaffordable when first provided to them. So that's pretty significant. Now, as you saw before, there is the higher price mortgage loan rule that took effect several years ago that has an ability to repay requirement in it. It's um, much more general than the new one in Dodd-Frank, but it does apply. Even if you have a loan that's not higher priced or that's, you know, before a certain effective date, 
there are a bunch of common law claims that one can consider for that type of abuse. And so it's worth thinking about that. Because I think, you know, the thing about truth and lending is a lot of the stuff we have talked about so far is very, very technical and not so compelling to a court. You know, I didn't get this piece of paper, you know, this inspection wasn't done like that. Um, but if you tell your client's story, that's what's really compelling. And especially if you've got an ability to repay claim, that's obviously the most compelling part of any person's story is that they were essentially purposely put into a situation where it was clear they were going to fail. And so that will help you with the other claims that you have. Um, as the um, time goes on, you may be able to start seeing more loans that came after the effective date for the very powerful Dodd Frank case as well. So let's go on and talk about them. We're not going to get through the details of every single slide, but I want you to have a general sense of what the issues are and sort of what to look for. Okay. So where do you start when you're wondering about an ability to repay claim? And remember, ability to repay applies to all covered mortgage loans, including the higher priced and the high cost mortgage loans. The effective date is that same January 10th, 2014. There are some carve outs. Hmm, this is not the slide I had in mind. There we go. Sorry about that. There are a few carve outs here for certain types of loans. Um, but in general, many, many loans are covered. And here is the general rule a reasonable, good faith determination of ability to repay. It's not the same as could your client afford it. It was the determination, both reasonable and in good faith. It also requires that there's verified and documented income, assets, and debt. Now, there is this thing called the qualified mortgage, which many of you, I'm sure, have heard of. It's essentially a presumption. It's a legal presumption that protects the creditor um, that they complied with this broader ability to repay requirement. And depending on the price of the loan your client got, it determines how airtight that presumption is. It's a, if it's a prime loan, then you get an absolute legal safe harbor if you're the creditor that you complied with the ability to repay if you make a loan that meets the definition of a qualified mortgage. You, representing your client, can still litigate and challenge whether or not it was a qualified mortgage. There are a lot of rules related to qualified mortgages. But once it's agreed that it's a qualified mortgage, your client has no recourse on the ability to repay claim. And I think one of the concerns that we have is that it may make it harder to also bring common law or other statutory claims um, if you don't have a violation of the ability to repay claim. This safe harbor is not in the statute. It was a split the, pa it was a split the baby regulatory choice that the CFPB made. They did, however, leave open more room for higher price mortgage and high cost loans. There's only a rebuttable presumption. So if your client got a loan that you they couldn't afford, let's say, and the loan was a qualified mortgage, even if it's a qualified mortgage, you can rebut that and say, even though it's a qualified mortgage, you still violated the general rule because you didn't make a reasonable and good faith determination of the ability. I'm having this idea that maybe we should make a Venn diagram of this in the future. So what can you do for your client? You can do actual damages, statutory damages, and these enhanced damages, plus attorney's fees. OK, so what do you do to figure out whether your client has one of these cases? Remember, you've got that reasonable and good faith determination. You only have to do one. And you're going to need to do some discovery to really be able to document that if your client got what appears, you know, at first blush to be, you know, something that someone should have known was unaffordable, then you're, I think, in a good position to then pursue discovery at a later date. But the claims are hard and you want to make sure you do your homework. So there are some factual questions you're going to want to ask about the reasonable and good faith determination. Was there a reset in the loan? And did they look at that? Um, when was that going to happen? Did the consumer share information that would have alerted the lender that there would be an affordability problem, like an impending retirement? 
or you know a transition to stay-at-home mom or medical bills or divorce plenty of things like that you'd have to document that they knew about it so if after you ask all those questions everything looked reasonable then you're going to have to look elsewhere for the solutions and a loan modification might be a very good solution for that the alternative is um, that you might find that they didn't seem to do a reasonable assessment and then you have to figure out some other questions if the delinquency occurred shortly after closing it's a lot easier to prove that it's an ability to repay problem that the loan was initially bad than if they defaulted three and a half years later you can still bring that and we'll talk about that in a moment but it's just harder did they did they default after a reset or was there this known event that they should have known about can you guys hear that beeping in the background can anyone hear that Michelle Becky I'm not hearing anything okay well I'll do something about it only if you hear it otherwise I'll just pretend it's not there okay so if the delinquency was delayed then you have to essentially prove that they were borrowing money um, or maxing out their credit cards so you can explain why the delinquency was delayed so then you're gonna have to sort of jump through a set of hoops and figure out which boxes this is an important slide your client fits into so there are you know ability to repay rules and QM rules based on the price of the loan the high cost the higher price you know or prime loan you have to figure out whether the loan met the qualified mortgage rules or not you have to figure out you know whether it falls into the safe harbor or the rebuttable presumption you have to think about what your other claims are so that's a big checkoff list part of determining which QM rules apply the qualified mortgage rules is to de determine what type of loan it was if it was owned by Freddie Mac or Fannie Mae or insured by them then there's one set of rules and there is a lookup mechanism for doing that I don't have it on here but you do that and you don't have it it's the same thing that you would use if you were trying to get a modification um, if it's um, a loan that's you know securitized on Wall Street that has a different set of rules if it's an FHA loan that has a different set of rules and then depending on who the lender was was it a small creditor do they operate in a rural area etc those will also have a bunch of other hoops that you have to jump through if it's Bank of America they're not going to generally be covered by those smaller rules also if there are special loan features like balloon prepayment penalty or it was a, a quote non-standard loan refinanced into a standard loan meaning it had a bunch of bad things in it like negative amortization and it was refinanced into something more conventional that's another product type and there are lots of slides about this we won't go into all the details about it but they'll be here when you need them so if you've got a loan that's just securitized on Wall Street the CFPB regulations on qualified mortgages apply so those are laid out in the regulation they're also laid out in chapter 9 I tried to put as much detail as I could in here but obviously you're gonna to have to just look at the sources one very important thing at the bottom of this slide is appendix Q appendix Q was taken from the FHA underwriting rules and it describes how you measure and weight income and debt and assets um, to, to do the analysis that you need so what are some of the rules for the qualified mortgage rule first of all in order to have a qualified mortgage it can have negative amortization it can't be interest only there's a 3% cap on points and fees this is the same points and fees definition that's in the high cost mortgage rule or the HOPA rule but the number is much lower and it's um, a source of a lot of friction with lenders who are saying the cap is too low and I think what that means is that they're going to try to make loans where they somehow squeeze in fees that don't appear to be part of the points and fees cap so if you look closely at how the loan was made and you find that there are some fees that were charged that purport to be excluded from this cap because there are certain types of fees that are excluded um, 
make sure that those really are what they say they are, that they were really paid to the parties you know, that are relevant, etc. So for example, payments made to an affiliated third party title company are treated differently, sorry, an affiliated title company are treated differently from payments made to a third party title company. Only the ones that are made to the affiliate are included in the points and fees because the purpose of the points and fees is to say how much money did the creditor get. And so if you're affiliated with the creditor, that's still really the creditor's pocket. And so there may be some shenanigans around that, and it's just worth keeping an eye on. They have to actually underwrite the loan. That's part of QM. Underwriting payments is here. Maximum rate for the first five years. And there's a hard debt-to-income ratio ceiling of 43%. So here's some information about what's in Appendix Q. If you've got somebody who's self-employed or got a renter, those are the types of things that will be relevant. Key thing you need to know about Fannie and Freddie loans <coughs> is until the earlier of January 10th, 2021, or until they're no longer in conservatorship, you know, they're currently controlled by the federal government, until that date, whatever their rules are is a qualified mortgage. So if it's eligible for purchase by Fannie and Freddie, or it's eligible to be insured by FHA, VA, USDA, RHS. As long as they're following the rules of those entities, then it's a qualified mortgage, even if it doesn't follow the CFPB's vanilla qualified mortgage rule that applies to privately securitized loans. That's why it's called temporary, because that's like a patch, and it's going to eventually um, move over. HUD actually has its own, so for the for GSEs, there's this sunset here. For HUD, they have their own FHA QM rule now. It already took effect on the same day, and so that's permanent. And the other agencies haven't done anything to, to, that I know of, and so I think they're, um, they're still in a situation where they're saying, you know, whatever applies, applies. But I hope we'll hear more from them about that. So there are, you know, separate rules for um, how to establish if it's eligible for purchase. If you're getting to that point, you know, just follow through on all the details so that you can dot your I's and cross your T's. So there are a lot of issues about small creditors. There's a very, very good small creditor compliance guide on the CFPB website. Um, I think it's called Small Entity Compliance Guide. And it walks through how to know if somebody's a small creditor. And that's information you're going to need to get online or elsewhere to be able to determine whether your client has an ability to repay claim because there are fewer rules. And these numbers here are like 2 billion and 500. Congress is on the verge of messing with all of those, but for now those are the numbers that apply, you know, unless, unless that changes. So a lot of the rules for the small credit are exactly the same, except you have to consider debt to income ratio or residual income. Residual income is how much money do you have left after your mortgage payments and your other regular payments are being made? Um, but there's no requirement for a specific number. So that 43% debt to income ratio does not apply um, the same way that it does um, if you're a larger creditor. Here's rules also about a small creditor. They have to hold a loan for at least three years in portfolio. But there's also a whole set of separate rules if it's a small creditor balloon. Um, I'm not going to go through all the details here, but just know if you've got a balloon payment, meaning at the end of the entire loan, you're, you know, on the payment schedule, you can see your client still has a payment of tens of thousands of dollars, for example, or more. Um, that's a balloon. And there are special rules if you've got both a small creditor and the balloon that apply, for example. And there are also other rules about balloon loans generally. And so if your client has a balloon, just make sure that you look for all of those rules. But these are some of the details that apply. I thought um, before I go on with the qualified mortgage rule that I would pause here for questions. Even if you can't hear that buzzer in the background, I can hear it, so I apologize. I need to go figure out where it is and shut it off because I'll be a little more focused than I am now. So I'll be back in one second. If you guys have questions that you haven't already sent, send them now and I'll be back in one second.
Okay, I'm back and I'm happy to take questions. Okay, so the first one is, what is the threshold interest rate for a prime loan before it becomes subprime? Maybe just a reference to how to figure that out. Ah, so we have a slide about that. I was just trying to not get into so much detail that we sort of got bogged down into it. Um, so I'm not going to go back. I'm not going to go back and put the slide on for you. I was just looking for the slide so I could um, read it to you because it's about it's about the um, average prime offer rate. So you have to find out what the average prime offer rate was, and then you add like one and a half percentage points or three and a half percentage points. And so that shifts over time, and so there's no one number. And what I should have done was figured out what is it today. Um, but I didn't do that, so I can't tell you that, and I apologize um, for not knowing that. Um, but that's that's why you have to figure out where you know wh what the average prime offer rate was on the date that the loan was made, and then you can add in that other stuff. Do you have a sense, at least maybe, uh, just you know what has it in generally in your head? Where would you look at an interest rate and say, mm, I'm going to check that because that seems a little bit high? Well, in a very low interest rate environment, you know, it could be like seven or eight percent. Right. Okay. Good. It doesn't have to be like twenty percent. Right. And then, you know, there's an interest rate trigger for high cost mortgages, um, different, which is even higher than that. Right. And so, figuring out if it's a higher price mortgage is only one piece of the question. If you think it's on the border with the higher price, you're going to want to do that too. So then the other question is a little bit different. So has anyone looked at the streamlined modification, in quotes, um, which is offered by Fannie and Freddie? And have they looked at them as unaffordable from inception uh, and perhaps inherently deceptive as not being made on the basis of affordability? Whoever asked that question should call me next week because my colleagues and I have spent a lot of time on that issue. Um, there is a slide in here actually about the streamline modification and how it's it's been deemed affordable and many of us have serious concerns about that. Okay. So Peter, if you're still listening at the moment, Elise has put her has offered her phone number for you for next week. <laughs> and um, my contact information is on the last slide. Perfect. Okay, that's all I have for right now, Elise. Great. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit more. We don't have that much more time. I, I don't know how much time exactly to leave at the end, but let me see if I can get through a bunch more of these slides. Okay. So um, there's also a whole separate set of rules for qualified mortgages. You can have a qualified mortgage that has a prepayment penalty, but there are certain rules, and the prepayment penalty can't last for more than the first three years of the loan because it would otherwise lock somebody in to the loan and not let them out. So if you have some of these characteristics, balloon, prepayment penalty, small creditor, then you need to kind of drill down and figure out, you know, all of these rules. So these are the rules. Just let them blur in front of you. It seemed better, you know, in our various trainings to have the details in there for people. Um, but we need all day really to go into all the details. And one thing that I want to flag is that if your client got something that they're claiming is that the creditor claims is a qualified mortgage and it has a prepayment penalty. They also have to be offered a similar one without. And one thing that's always true is often what offered means is they put it as a piece of paper at the bottom of the closing papers and the client didn't about it. Um, and we told the Fed that and the CFPB when they made rules like this, but here are the rules for what similar has to be. Um, and I would argue that if it wasn't really offered if the person they purposely hit it, essentially. So these are refinancings that are exempt from ability to repay. This is what I was referring to before. So if you've got a refinancing from kind of a more abusive looking loan to a less abusive one, there's a bunch of rules. That's this first bullet here. And then the last bullet is the modification point from before about why they're not covered by this specific rule. And the bullet right before is about the FHA 
streamline refi, which is or automatically considered a qualified mortgage protected rule or loan by FHA. And Fannie and Freddie, you know, basically have the same thing. So these are more rules about the standard, the non-standard to the standard. There's the information about the standard loans. Now it's time for our last poll. I'm going to try to launch it now. Here we go. I just launched it. So I was wondering when you have clients in foreclosure, what the causes of foreclosure were and to what extent are they essentially caused by abuses of um, affordability on the origination gate versus subsequent occurrences like medical divorce, job loss. And so this question is also different because I'm not asking yes or no. I'm asking, I'm asking what proportion of your foreclosure cases is attributable to ability to repay. And the answers right now that I can see are all over the map, but only about half of you have voted, so I'll wait like another moment. Okay, I'll let people keep voting for a minute, but I'm going to kind of go on. So what I'm seeing here is that although maybe a third of the people haven't really seen ability to repay, they're mostly seeing people who faced hardship. That a, can you guys see the results, or is it just me? Becky, um, Michelle, I'm not sure how the attendees can whether whether they see the results. Okay, so let me so let me tell you since you can't. So we've got about 30 percent in the zero to five percent category. But then we've got approximately 20% in all the other categories um, for what the instances of ability to repay problems causing foreclosure. And so that's really substantial. Um, and so what that means is when your clients are coming in now and they're saying, you know, I can't pay my mortgage, we're all kind of in this era of um, resorting to loan mods, which is important and good. But think about whether you have ability to repay claims because it's clear that it's a huge problem. So I'm going to close this and go on because um, we have really limited time and I want to make sure that we get through a few more things. Okay. So if it's a, a qualified mortgage, you have to figure out which price point it's in. So if it's higher price or high cost or just regular, that'll affect this group here is the safe harbor and this is the rebuttable presumption group. And so that's why you're back to figuring out whether you've got the rebuttal presumption and what to do with it. So the question then is, how do you rebut the presumption? And this is some guidance from this, you know, from the CFPB, and there are some pretty juicy parts in here. You have to look at, you know, all the pieces, the income and the debt, etc. And you essentially have to do this analysis here of insufficient residual income. Essentially, even though the loan met all of the qualifications of this. Um, presumed safe loan, your client was not left with enough money to pay. Whether or not the creditor knew in this context is not relevant. It's only relevant whether they can afford to pay their bills. And so after they're paying all of their regular bills, how much money do they have for buses and childcare and medicine and food, etc., utilities? So, um, so that's an analysis that is going to really blossom over the next few years. It's new. We don't know how courts are going to deal with it. Now, the creditor had to be aware of any recurring material non-debt obligations, but they don't have to be aware that your client takes the bus every day. They only have to be aware of something very, very big. And obviously, they had to have you know, done the rest of the analysis. So that's what the rebuttal, we think, is going to look like you know, based on what's been said. If you don't have a qualified mortgage at all, there's still a whole set of rules about ability to repay. And so a lot of our clients, all of us, are going to end up with loans that are not qualified mortgages because they are interacting with different types of creditors or they have more challenged credit histories or they live in neighborhoods where conventional banks don't tend to operate, etc. And so a lot of those homeowners are going to end up with what's called a non-QM loan, a loan that doesn't even purport to be a qualified mortgage, but it's still required to be 
compliant with the ability to repay standard. The difference is that that standard is mushy and does not have bright lines the way the qualified mortgage does, but there are entities out there who are planning to make all of their money making, non, making non-qualified mortgages to people who don't qualify for the other type of loan. Um, and I think it still remains to be seen you know, what that's going to look like. So here's just going through all of the prongs of the ability to repay analysis. And so if you're with non-QM, it's sort of like doing um, you know, a common law fraud type of claim where you would look at all the different pieces and then you make your best argument for why there wasn't a so-called reasonable and good faith evaluation. So these are all the different income and debt pieces. You're also going to want to use residual income as part of that, even though you don't have the rebuttal to deal with. Note that if you have certain kinds of loans, there are different kinds of calculations for that. So if you've got a balloon or negative amortization, there are special rules about how to calculate affordability, maximum payment. So part of the question is, what is the number you start with? It's the maximum payment for the first five years for the balloon, but for other loans, it's not actually the maximum payment. It's the so-called fully indexed payment, which um, is a different number and is generally lower. And if you get to that point and you have a question, call me, because we spent weeks trying to fix that in the statute and we were unable to do that. So there's also a lot of flexibility about incorporating the verification aspect of how income is documented. So if you have a client who has more informal sources of income, there are these third party sources here that are considered adequate, <clears throat> but they were supposed to be used. And so you need to figure out whether that was done or not. There's a lot of commentary here about how income is defined and what um, should have been included in the analysis, including public assistance and alimony, for example, bonuses, tips, and commissions. And then there's also whether all the current debt was considered. Um, there is a very specific rule that I don't have a separate slide on that I want to flag for you about student debt, which is there are assumptions about how long the student debt will last, et cetera. And so if you have a client who has student debt, um, you want to make sure that it was incorporated correctly. And so here there's you know, there's information in the rule about it. And I think, you know, at some point we'll start doing trainings that are about the specifics of each of these types of analyses. But we're just not there yet because, truthfully, when we do conferences and trainings, people are mostly still doing foreclosure defense and they're not seeing so many new loans that fall under the, the new rules because they're so recent. So remember also that you want to look at the rules about credit history, for the non-QM loans, there are specific rules on how they should evaluate credit history and how they shouldn't. There are rules about rental and utility payment history. They're allowed to use that, even though sometimes it can damage your client's prospects, et cetera. So this is a very interesting fact. And this is not related to QM in particular. This is just about ability to repay claims in general. Um, and this was a real win that we got it into the regulation. It says, a consumer statement or attestation that the consumer has the ability to repay the loan. So if a consumer says, you know, in writing, I can afford this loan, is not indicative of whether the creditor's determination was reasonable in good faith. Why did we try to get that in? Because we didn't want to have people just signing an extra piece of paper at closing that attests to the fact that the loan complies with the ability to repay rule, and then the creditor uses that as a defense later. And so that's very good. Um, I don't know whether some entities will try to use that as a defense in light of that, but just know that that's out there. And then another helpful thing that's out there, especially for the non-QM piece, but also for the rebuttal, is the question of ability to repay compliance is based on the facts and, sorry, I clicked on it by mistake, on the facts and circumstances of an individual extension of credit and how the creditor's underwriting standards were applied to those facts and circumstances. So you can really sort of delve into the specifics of your client and what happened. So they also have a list in the regulation of evidence 
that um, that the analysis was not reasonable or not in good faith. They're very clear that it's not the elements of a claim, but it is evidence, but they've got tons of stuff in here like disregarding certain kinds of information about residual income, whether it was applied consistently, which could also raise some discrimination issues, I guess. Um, whether there was um, a default shortly after consummation is itself evidence, even if it's not the element of a claim, etc. And then they also tried to talk about how the facts are really on a continuum, and so there's no sort of bright line, but you can see here the longer the payments were made, the less likely that um, the initial assessment of the ability to repay was unreasonable. And so that's why if your client was barring from family members for two years and then maxed out her credit cards for another two years and then defaulted, four years is a long time to be making all your mortgage payments and then say that it was unaffordable. And so that's why you would have to document all of that. I also want to point out here that it says early payment default on its own may even be sufficient to establish a prima facie case, but it may be caused by subsequent changes of circumstances. And so the creditor might still try to show that it was a subsequent change in circumstance and it wasn't what your client, you know, it wasn't what the creditor did, what their client did. But it might allow you to establish a prima facie case, which is really helpful. There's also this part here, foregoing necessities such as food and heat, which you might also be able to document. That's my contact information. I don't know if there are more questions. I'd love to hear them if there are. Uh, so let's see. Uh, some of question was asked earlier, but does the ATR apply to loan modifications? The ATR does not apply to loan modifications because it has to be a new loan. And so let me just say a word about the CFPB servicing regulations, which is not what this training is about, which is those servicing regulations also don't require that the loan modification be affordable. They are basically procedural rules that say, that don't even say you have to do a loan modification if you're a servicer. They just say, if you're in foreclosure, if a client's in foreclosure and the servicer is providing loss mitigation, then they have to follow all of these rules. And so the situation we're in is that we've got the Home Affordable Modification Program. We have HAMP. We have a lot of proprietary mods. We have you know, government programs. We have the GSEs and their loan modification programs. But a lot of them are going to expire soon. Um, Fannie and Freddie just announced they're extending their HAMP for another year till the end of 2016, and that they are not extending it after that. Treasury may or may not extend theirs, but even if they do, it's not going to last forever. And we don't have anything requiring sustainable loan modifications to be made. Um, Many of us are trying to fix that, um, but that's an ongoing challenge. So I still think that there are unfairness and other common law claims that you can bring in a foreclosure defense context. Our foreclosures manual is very good on those issues, but these rules don't apply. Okay, so let's see. Um, oh, the verification code. So let's just make sure everybody knows where that is. Um, if you go to the chat box, I'm just trying to scroll and see it myself so I can read it out loud. The yes. CLE code. Yep. Oh, Michelle. No, I was going to say that the verific the CLE code is located in the chat box, um, and it is eight Y is in yellow thirty three. So that's eight Y is in yellow thirty three. And don't forget to uh, do your evaluations as well. I was just going to, if we have an extra second, I'll just put on the APOR slide because someone had asked about that before. Oh, that's great. Thanks. So, at least this was actually, great. I, so, so far, I don't see, let's see, I just want to make sure I'm not missing anybody. So far, I don't see any additional questions at the moment. Okay. Um, at least any final words? Well, I wanted you to just flag, this is the slide that tells you what the triggers are for the higher price mortgage loans. The APR here, the APR has to be greater than A4 plus 1.5 or A4 greater than 3.5 if it's a subordinate lien. And then this is the slide that, that's right before it that describes how to find A4. What I would say is when your clients come in, 
getting them into a situation that works for them is what you need. But if you know whether they have origination claims, you know how much leverage you have to try to get a modification. It gives you more leverage to know that you have origination claims, especially if they don't easily qualify for the best loan modifications that are out there. And so it does your client a service for you to be able to know how much leverage you have and also potentially to access those additional remedies that are available to them. We have lots of resources at NCLC and we're always happy to help. So there is one question about um, all of the acronyms in the PowerPoint. Um, and there are a lot, no question about it. I think, um, Elise, you did a pretty good job in trying to keep those acronyms um, defined throughout, you know, in the, in the PowerPoint. There was a question if there was a key to all of the abbreviations in the PowerPoint. Um, my suspicion is that there isn't a key. Say. You know what? There's not, but maybe I should make one, and then I can send it to you guys. That would be a nice little tool. Thanks. But and I think I, in the meantime, maybe um, Derek is the person who asked this. Derek, I, Elise is, is very accommodating, um, and so if you have a specific question you can't quite figure it out, you can call me or you can call Elise directly and get it right from the source. Um, I hope and I would strongly suggest... Um, if you have a question, to email me because you'll get a faster answer than if you call me. True. So you can see here it's a Cohen at nclc.org. Um, my father told me that when I moved to Washington, my incidence of acronyms went up substantially. So um, <laughs> um, I think making a key is a great idea, and I might start doing that in our presentation. So thank you for that. Okay, I think that's it. The only thing I wanted to just say is that we do have our webinar scheduled for next month, who will be also another NCLC staff member, or at least of council. Um, you've seen her name before, it was Sarah Mancini with um, NCLC, and this time she's going to be talking about uh, reverse mortgages, um, very specifically the, the, there's been a lot of changes going on right now with the non-borrowing spouse of reverse mortgages and when they become a widow, uh, what happens and how you keep that person in the home if they're not on the note. So stay tuned, that's June 10th, same time, 12 o'clock, um, but that's coming up next month. And Elise, you are wonderful, thank you so much. This is a lot of information. We could spend days on this information. Um, and we can. What's that? And we can in the future. Yes, and so for those of you who are interested in spending more wonderful time on this information, there are, there's both a NCLC conference coming up, a, a directly related to mortgages coming up in D.C. in July, and there's also the one in San Antonio, which is the more, the broader NCLC conference coming up in, I want to say, November in San Antonio, is that right? Yes, that's correct. So those are coming up, and I can tell you that for me personally, I've been going to them every year since I started doing this work, and they're an invaluable part of the work that I do. And so um, this information is complicated, it's hard, and it's difficult to kind of keep it all in your head when you're looking at a case. So go t if you are looking at these kinds of cases and you're looking at trying to find ways to get those hooks for those origination claims, um, sitting through these trainings over and over and over again typically is the way that it works for me to kind of get it into my head. So I encourage it if you're able to go. And Elise, thank you very, very much. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a nice day.